should begin. It didn't occur, occur to me until after we uh, posted the news of the lecture that I should have really also posted a reading assignment for my former students, then given them a reading quiz at the start of this period to see if you've done it. But uh, perhaps you can do without that particular uh, reminiscence of Shattuck, uh, Shattuck St. Mary's. Uh, every year for a number of years, the development department has asked uh, me and asked some other teachers to give uh, programs or presentations uh, on Alumni Weekend, which I'm very happy to do. Being a historian, I usually try to link this with some important historical event whose anniversary might be celebrated. Last year, of course, we had the dolorous anniversary of the 100th, not celebration, commemoration, start of World War I. Uh, this year, we have something that is at least as famous, uh, and it was a natural thing to want to give a lecture upon the Waterloo campaign. We are just 13 days away from the 200th anniversary of the most famous battle that has ever been fought. Perhaps in the United States, uh, we tend to think of Gettysburg more, but even in American English, we still say someone has met his Waterloo, but we don't say anybody has met his Gettysburg. Uh, the term has become proverbial. Uh, and in a few days, you will undoubtedly see in the news a lot of information on this uh, campaign and battle, and I thought perhaps a review of what actually happened uh, might be interesting and useful. A Waterloo was not a battle, it was a short, remarkably short and remarkably violent military campaign covering four days, culminating in the Battle of Waterloo, but involving uh, two other battles uh, two days previously. Uh, if this lecture has a theme other than just what actually happened, it is summed up here in this citation from von Clausewitz, the Prussian military philosopher. Um, you've had a chance to read this now. I can only say that the Waterloo campaign particularly proves uh, that this is true, and since von Clausewitz took part in the Waterloo campaign, uh, he knew it as well as anybody else. The difficulty is, of course, in putting everything into 40 or 45 minutes, and so I will have to omit most of the backstory, but just to remind you of things you undoubtedly already know, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, Emperor of the French, uh, was forced to abdicate in April of 1814, following the campaign in France, a brilliant campaign where for three months he, with very small forces, had made uh, fools, really, of a much larger allied force, but in the end was forced to succumb partly by superior numbers and partly by the fact that his marshals, his chief generals, were really very tired of fighting and could see no point in going on because defeat was inevitable. He therefore advocated and was sent to the little island of Elba off the coast of Italy, uh, where he was permitted to retain the title emperor and have an army of 1,000 men chosen from his old guard. The Europeans' uh, leaders then went to the Congress of Vienna, where they began carving up the map of Europe uh, and trying to undo the French Revolution and all that had, fo uh, had followed from it, uh, a revolution that, at least in their minds, Napoleon uh, represented. But Napoleon was only in his mid-40s at this time, uh, and he had no intention of staying on Elba any longer than necessary. Uh, the disagreements at the Congress of Vienna, where uh, Russia practically went to war with Austria over questions of what would happen to Poland, uh, and the British attempts to maintain the balance of power, and the fact that the restored government of France, the restored Bourbons under Louis XVIII, uh, were really very unpopular. Louis XVIII was a fairly benevolent uh, type, but the people who surrounded him, these emigres who had returned after 25 years in exile, were also intent on undoing much of the French Revolution as they could. Uh, Napoleon judged that it was worth a risk, and so uh, he slipped away from Elba in two boats in February of 1815, and on the 1st of March he landed uh, on the coast of France uh, to see if he was still popular. Uh, he was. Uh, what happened in the next few days was really incredible. Uh, military units sent to stop Napoleon joined him, one after another, and here in this picture, with the details, this soldier has carefully preserved the eagle, which was atop the standard of his regiment in Napoleonic times. Uh, we see a civilian here in the background. Uh, this flag, which you would just say, well, that's the French flag, had not anymore, it wasn't. The Bourbons uh, banned that flag because it was the symbol of the revolution that had beheaded Louis XVIII's elder brother, uh, and we're using the white Bourbon flag. Most Frenchmen didn't like that. Uh, Napoleon was hailed by the army and had a triumphal progress to Paris, where Louis XVIII, who had been in exile for 25 years and been back in France for a few months, I hope he didn't unpack his bags, uh, hurriedly left for Brussels with his small number of supporters. Uh, as Napoleon was marching in Paris, some witty person posted a placard on the Tuileries Palace gates, uh, from Napoleon to Louis, please don't send any more soldiers, I have enough. 
Uh, Napoleon returns to Paris in triumph and announces to Europe that he wants only peace, that he has no wish to restore the French Empire, that he merely wishes peace with everyone. And I think he was telling the truth, uh, at least in the short term, uh, because certainly France was in no condition to fight a war. The king had to mobilize the military forces, and the one thing that most people were satisfied with was that there was no more war. However, when the Congress of Vienna discovered that the Oger, as they sometimes called him, had returned, they immediately broke up the conference, declared him an international outlaw, and they all declared war on France. So it was questioned whether France was going to fight or whether Napoleon would be shot by the first person who came along, because that's what you could do with outlaws. He decided to fight. The result was quite remarkable. Uh, in two months, and this is often overlooked because of what happened in the third months, uh, Napoleon and his administration managed to raise an army of 250,000 veteran troops, uh, well-equipped, well-armed, even if the uniforms weren't quite as spiffy in all cases as they should have been, and prepare for a major war. Now, of these 250,000 troops, of course, he could not take them all with him someplace. Uh, the Pyrenees Mountains had to be guarded against Spain. The Rhine frontier had to be guarded against Austria. Uh, the Italian frontier had to be guarded. But when all these deductions were made, he had 125,000 men in the so-called Army of the North, uh, a loyal and skilled army under veteran commanders uh, to do what he wanted with. The question is, what did he want to do with it? It did not take someone of Napoleon's ability to judge that if he just sat there and waited, even though he could mobilize additional numbers of men, he'd be annihilated, just as he was in 1814, uh, when the Russians and Austrians and British and Prussians and Spanish and some Italian states all marched against him. There was you no know, way to win. However, that wasn't going to happen. Uh, the Russians were coming, but to mobilize a Russian army in the middle of nowhere, uh, compared to if you're in France, and move it all the way halfway across Europe was going to take many, many weeks, if not months. Um, the Austrians could mobilize a little quicker, but they also wouldn't show up for a while. And Napoleon had hopes of a diplomatic settlement because he was still married uh, to the daughter of the Austrian emperor. He was still the Austrian emperor's son-in-law. His uh, second wife, uh, Marie Louise, had uh, left him and taken their son with her uh, when he had fallen from power. He, she did not accompany him to Elba, but nonetheless, uh, he was still an in-law, and uh, their son was still half a Habsburg, and the Austrians, it was known, were not particularly anxious to see the Russians get any stronger, so maybe if he could win a victory, Austria might uh, take a more compromising position. But there were two enemy armies that he could fight immediately. One was the, the well, we call it the British Army, but that's a misnomer. I'll get into that in a minute. The other was the Prussians. They were both in Belgium. And now we have to take a look at the forces that were uh, available and the commanders of those armies. Uh, I think you recognize the man on the right, uh, and it's hardly necessary to say, for me to say anything about his military ability. Uh, this man had made such a reputation that the man on the left said of him, whose presence on the battlefield is worth 40,000 men. In 1813, the commander-in-chief of the Allied armies against Napoleon, Field Marshal Prince Schwarzenberg, the Austrian commander, on the eve of the Battle of Leipzig, wrote in a letter to his wife, When I consider that I face the greatest military commander of our age, a veritable emperor of battles, then, my dear Nanny, I must admit that I feel my shoulders too weak and will collapse under the gigantic task which weighs upon them. There are some commentators who say that by 1815, Napoleon power, Napoleon's powers were somewhat failing, uh, that he was uh, subject to various illnesses. Uh, a gentleman just suggested to me before this lecture of one of these illnesses. Uh, one can only say that if his powers were failing, they were still pretty good. In 1814, he had fought one of the most magnificent campaigns of his life. In 1815, he came up with a plan uh, of action that uh, was brilliant and is acknowledged as such. But he was sometimes subject to fits of lethargy for reasons we do not know. He was destined to die, most likely of stomach cancer, unless he really was poisoned, which I think improbable. Uh, six years later, the same thing that he killed his father in his 50s, and perhaps there were some manifestations of that at a very minor level. But one cannot say that uh, illness was a serious factor in the Waterloo campaign. The man on the left, Arthur Wellesley, the Duke of Wellington, is probably the greatest soldier that England ever produced. Uh, as you can tell from this excellent portrait, he is an aristocrat, now to his fingertips, an Anglo-Irish aristocrat, uh, a veteran soldier who had fought brilliantly in India, but he is most famous, uh, at least up until 1815, for leading the British, Spanish, and Portuguese forces in the Peninsular War uh, in Spain between 1809 and 1814, where he fought and normally defeated a succession of Napoleon's marshals, well, not Napoleon himself, finally ending up with invading southern France shortly before Napoleon's abdication. 
Uh, Wellington later became known as the Iron Duke, a strict disciplinarian, uh, a man who was very haughty, certainly, and he once said in a letter <laughs> describing his own army, he said, you know, they're the scum of the earth. But he then went on to say, but what splendid fellows we can make out of them. Uh, but a man who did care for his men and who was on the whole popular because soldiers realize that a general who wins will have far less casualties than a general who loses. Um, the wild card in this uh, deck is the man that most people forget about, Field Marshal von Blücher, the commander of the Prussian army. Uh, Blücher was a professional soldier from the age of about 12, I think. He started with the Swedes and then joined the Prussians. Uh, remember, there is no Germany. There's no country called Germany at this time. There's a bunch of small German states and a couple of big ones of Prussian and you know, Austrian is Germanic. Uh, Blücher was an impetuous, hot-headed man whose nickname was Alt Vorwärts, Old Forward, uh, who always wanted to attack, who had a bitter personal hatred of Napoleon because of the humiliation that Napoleon had inflicted on his country in 1806, where one day, he had annihilated the army of Frederick the Great, which had been preserved sort of as a museum piece, uh, and overran the entire country. Uh, a fiery man who was certainly willing to attack at a moment's notice. He and Wellington were supposed to cooperate. Uh, neither one had a superior rank. But Wellington, the cautious, the defensive fighter, a man known for his not being impetuous, and Blucher, the exact opposite, might not exactly cooperate. Furthermore, their armies were geographically separated, although not by very much. Their armies were not integrated. And now we have to take a look at those armies. The French army was excellent. As I say, veteran troops under veteran officers, particularly the middle rank officers, very devoted to the emperor, uh, very willing to fight. It was a powerful sword in Napoleon's hands. The higher command, well, we'll see that. Uh, he appointed as his second in command Marshal Ney, Michel Ney, the bravest of the brave, a title he had fully earned in his commanding the rear guard of the retreat from Russia. But Ney, a very impetuous, uh, sort of stereotypical redhead, uh, you'll see him in the picture later on, uh, Ney in this campaign, let's just say, is not at his very best. Uh, indeed, some say that the commanding the rear guard in Russia had, had done something to him from which he never entirely recovered, although he completely devoted to Napoleon. The interesting, well, I'll talk about the Prussian army. The Prussian army was a hodgepodge. Uh, the one thing that the Prussian army had in common is that everybody spoke German. Uh, that was about it, however. Uh, many of the Prussian troops were veterans of the campaigns of 1813 and 14 and were as good as anybody's soldiers. Many of them were Landwehr, uh, National Guardsmen, who were very ardent to fight. They hated Napoleon because of his occupation of Prussia and humiliation of the country. In Germany, the War of 1813 is not called the Campaign of 1813. It's called the Befreiungskrieg, the War of Liberation. They still call it that. And they were very eager to fight. But Manwehr, militia, you never can tell exactly what they'll do. And then there were the non-Prussian contingents. Uh, troops had been drafted from the Kingdom of Saxony. They hated the Prussians. 10,000 of them were so deserted about a week before Waterloo, in fact, they had to be sent home. There were a lot of soldiers from the Rhineland. The Rhinelanders, which were now, who were now legally part of Prussia, did not like the Prussians, who they looked upon as barbarians, uh, and did not want to fight anybody at all, really, and perhaps they could not be strictly dependent upon, as we will see. So Blücher's army was really a very mixed bag, uh, although it at least had common language. Wellington's army didn't even have that. Although we usually speak of the British army at Waterloo, uh, that is not really the right term. The Anglo-Allied army is better, because what did Wellington have? He had an army consisting of some British troops. Some of those were veterans of the Peninsular War, among the finest soldiers in the world. Some were green troops sent out from England who were green troops. You never can tell exactly what they'll do. That was the British contingent, about a third of his army. About a third of the army was Dutch-Belgian. Uh, Belgium had been given to Holland at the Treaty uh, at the Congress of Vienna. The Belgians, who speak French, uh, do not like the Dutch, who speak Dutch, very much. This was not a popular union, but their soldiers had to serve too. The Dutch contingent consisted again of a mixture of veteran troops who were quite good, militia who were quite not good, Belgian troops who didn't want to fight at all. Most of them were veterans. They had fought for France when Belgium had been under the Napoleonic Empire. Uh, again, a very mixed bag. Wellington's second in command was the Prince of Orange, the son of the King of Holland. The Prince of Orange was 23 years old. His military ability could easily be engraved on the head of a pin. If anything happened to Wellington, the army would fall apart within a few days because the Prince of Orange, whenever he made a military decision, made a bad one. And I may have a chance to show you a couple of them. Wellington, uh, and then there was the German contingent, about a third of the army. 
Wellington had troops from the Kingdom of Hanover, because the British king, uh, still at uh, this time George III, uh, was um, also king of Hanover. He had the Brunswick troops from the Duchy of Brunswick, commanded by the Duke of Brunswick, whose father had been killed at the Battle of Vienna, 1806, and who was burning for revenge on uh, Napoleon. He had troops from Nassau, not the West Indies, but the little German state of Nassau. He had troops from uh, the King's German Legion, who were basically Germanic mercenaries, uh, veteran troops, fought well in Spain, hired, uh, by the, uh, hired by the British and remnants of the, the older Hanoverian army. He had a grab bag army that spoke, I think all the British troops spoke English, but some of the Scots probably spoke mostly Gaelic. Uh, he had uh, people speaking Dutch and French uh, and German. Uh, none of the commanders knew each other. Uh, Wellington himself said, I've never seen such an army. I'll do the best I can with it. <laughs> Can't promise too much. It was an army that would be fitted for defense, but not for any complicated offensive maneuvers, and Wellington pined for the army he had had in Spain, his veteran excellent army, which was long since gone. Indeed, many of those veteran excellent regiments had been shipped over here in 1814, and one of them got to getting shot to pieces by Andrew Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans. Fortunately, they didn't ship Wellington over here with them, or we might be drinking tea about this time, but uh, they sent his brother-in-law back at him and managed to get himself killed uh, at uh, New Orleans. So there you have the three armies. Uh, Wellington had about 110,000 men. Blucher had about 120, 125,000 men. Uh, both of them, I say, to the size of Napoleon's army. But Napoleon was going to steal a march on them. Napoleon was going to surprise them. Perhaps I should say just one or two words about weapons. Um, the basic weapon was the, the smoothbore musket. Uh, and there wasn't much to choose between the muskets issued to various troops. Uh, these things could be fired about five shots a minute by a trained soldier at the start of the battle and maybe two shots a minute after an hour because the barrel would become foul with powder. Uh, they were highly inaccurate at anything more than 100 yards, and so the troops were trained to fire more or less together in the hopes that they would hit something. Um, but at shorter ranges, they were pretty accurate. And since they fired a 70 to 75 caliber ball, the wounds they inflicted were truly grievous. Uh, they were truly awful, and of course, with medical care being what it was, we had been had little chance of really getting a great deal of help. The artillery, contrary to what you see in most movies, did not fire exploding objects for the most part. They fired solid iron cannonballs. These cannonballs would hit something or not, bounce, roll, hit something, and keep bouncing and rolling with considerable kinetic energy up to 1,000 or 1,200 yards. Uh, they did have a case shot, which is basically a bag or a container full of musket balls, uh, which was used at very close range and turned a cannon into a gigantic shotgun, a very effective weapon. Um, and the British had shrapnel, which could explode and, and well, form shrapnel, but they didn't use it very much. It was mostly uh, used in sieges. Uh, and so basically the cannonball hit and rolled. This is important for the Battle of Waterloo, uh, as, we shall, as we shall see. Cavalry were still armed with sabers. Uh, they carried a couple of pistols, they couldn't hit anything with them, and they were still used for cavalry charges, and we'll certainly see examples of that uh, as, we, uh, as we go on here. Napoleon's plan was to march north before the Allies knew that he was coming. And this handy little map illustrates the entire campaign, 15th, 16th, 17th, and 18th of June. The Belgian border is about here. France would concentrate, the French army would concentrate at Charlevoix and then move north. The Prussian army was dispersed in this region. The British army was dispersed, which I, I'll use that term for convenience, was dispersed in this region, and neither of them knew for sure that Napoleon was coming. They should have, but in fact, they did not do so. With the result that Napoleon on the 15th of June will move up to contact with the Allies, Ligny, and Corte Bras. On the 16th of June, there will be battles at Ligny and Corte Bras. On the 17th of June, there will be movement, Allied retreats and French advances, but no fighting for reasons that we'll see. And on the 18th of June, we have the battle called Waterloo. Uh, you might notice on the other maps, you will not be able to find Waterloo. It's not on the battlefield. Waterloo is the place where Wellington had its headquarters the night before the battle, and the winner gets to name the battle. Uh, but the town itself is not, uh, is not on the battlefield. Uh, this is, the uh, same sketch of the entire campaign. Okay. On the night of the 15th of June, uh, the French made, in the afternoon, made contact with the Prussian pickets. And for the first time, although rumors had been circulating, Blucher realized that Napoleon was coming with some troops. 
uh, as the day developed, they realized Napoleon was coming with a great many troops. So he ordered his army to concentrate around the town of Ligny and sent messages to Wellington. Wellington at first seemed to disbelieve that this was really happening. Uh, it is famous that on the night of the 15th, he and many of his senior officers went to a ball held by the Duchess of Richmond. And it was during this ball that Wellington finally received messages to the effect that Napoleon was on him and he better do something quick. So he ordered his army to concentrate uh, near the town of Cordebra and further to the further to the west. I might add that Wellington was always, during this whole campaign, was worried that Napoleon would flank him uh, on the right. Uh, this is the coast up here, the English Channel is up here, and Wellington was very, very cautious about this flank because he did not want the French to get around and cut him off uh, from England, which was the last refuge in the event that something went, uh, went really wrong, and a cautious commander like Wellington would admit that something could go really wrong. So on the morning of the 16th of June, the French army, which had concentrated here, was moving up towards Ligny and towards Cordoba. Napoleon took two-thirds of his army and marched on the Prussians. His plan, obviously, was to defeat the enemy armies separately, not to fight them on the same battlefield. That would be highly undesirable. Marshal Ney, with about a third of the army, two army corps, the corps of first and second corps, were sent up to seize the crossroads at Cordoba, four arms, with a nice crossroads, and prevent any English troops from helping Blucher. Wellington, earlier in the day, had ridden down to see Blucher and said, I'll come and help you if I can, and the Prussians were rather hoping that he would show up. Uh, Wellington, during this time, was reported to have made the remark, Napoleon has humbugged me by God. He has gained 24 hours march on me. Uh, there are some historians who say Wellington didn't say that, but even if he did, well, Napoleon had humbugged him, as a matter of fact, and was now in a very, very strong position. On the 16th of June, we have the battles of Ligny and the Battle of Corte Bras. As the battle at Ligny developed, the Prussians holding many villages here, some of which aren't seen, a vicious fight in the center. Napoleon decided that what the best plan was to outflank the enemy on their right. Perhaps I should explain, it's a military convention, you always refer to an army from its own point of view. The French are facing north, so this is the French left, this is the French right. The Prussians, the British, are facing south, so this is their left and this is their right. So we say, for example, that Napoleon, with his left, was going to encircle the Prussian right. For that purpose, he would use Derlon's corps, which was slowly coming up the road to help Marshal Ney. Uh, he would have that corps turn aside and come in behind the Prussians. Uh, a staff officer was dispatched, uh, but it's not clear if he had a written order or not uh, to tell Derlon to turn aside. This will cause problems, as we will see in a moment. Napoleon engaged the enemy, fought the enemy, but wasn't really seeking a decision. He was waiting for these troops to come up on the enemy flank late in the afternoon. What happened here at Corte Bras is remarkable. Marshal Ney, as I just said, was a fiery commander who never hesitated to attack, except on June 16, 1815. He did not know what was between him and Corte Bras. He did know that Wellington was somewhere in the vicinity, and he had fought Wellington in Spain with unfortunate results for him, uh, for Ney. Uh, the grass was very, very high. You could not see into the crossroads. And so, with his second corps, which is the one he had, the first corps was long behind, but he was expecting to come up and help him, and some small amounts of cavalry, he pushed north. In the morning, there was one Dutch division at Cordoba, about 5,000 men. That was it. Wellington had blundered here. He had ordered his army to concentrate, but it couldn't concentrate in time. It was being brought up from different directions, uh, as we see here. Corte Bras is, uh, is there. And all these troops would take all day to come in. Some of them wouldn't be there that day at all. If, well, if Ney had advanced boldly, he would have overrun Corte Bras, but he didn't advance boldly. And so he got involved in what's called a meeting engagement. As soon as his troops got close to Corte Bras, more of Wellington's soldiers would arrive, and it turned into a sort of a brawl that nobody was going to get the advantage of, although by the end of the day, Wellington would have more men, because Derlon's corps, that Ney was counting on, was now marching in this direction. But nobody told Ney. He received no order from Napoleon saying, I have detached this corps from you. And late in the afternoon, when he was desperate for troops and saying, where is Derlon, he was finally told, oh, he's marching, he's marching east. And he sent immediate orders for Derlon to come back and help him. Napoleon noticed off in the distance troops arriving and didn't know at first whose troops they were, and then it was reported they were Derlon's troops. Ah, that's good, they're coming in with a big flank attack. And then they all marched away because they received Ney's order to return. 
and it was now too close to darkness to recall them. Remember, we're talking here about 20,000 men marching in long columns. You don't turn that on a dime. It takes a while. Uh, Derlon's corps, which would have been decisive in either battle, spent the entire day marching back and forth between them and never fought anybody at all. With night coming on, it was essential that Napoleon defeat the Prussians, and so, having softened up their center, he gave up the idea of a flank attack. There's no troops over there to do it. He sent in the Imperial Guard, his best troops, which simply smashed right through the center of the Prussian army and scattered it to the four winds, and the whole Prussian army began to retreat. Blucher, being Blucher, took one cavalry regiment and led a charge against the French, and the French formed square, shot the charge to pieces. Blucher fell off his horse, the horse fell on top of him. It was dark, nobody noticed him, except his aide de camp, who managed in the darkness to get the shaken old man, he was in his 70s, uh, back on a horse and trot away north. The Prussian army was in great confusion, uh, having lost twice as many men as the French, having lost about 25,000 men to the French, 11,500. Napoleon had won a nice, solid victory. Napoleon assumed that was the end of the Prussians. He wouldn't be seeing them again. They would just drift north here, and that was out of the battle. Over here, at the end of the day, the British had, uh, the Anglo allies had pushed the French back to their starting point. And Napoleon had received no reports on what happened at Corte Bra. That was the action of 16 June. The next morning, nothing happened. Napoleon toured the battlefield at Ligny. He informed Marshal Grouchy that he would be detached with about 30,000 men to follow the Prussians, but he didn't order that to happen yet. And when Grouchy said, Sire, what are my orders? Napoleon said, I'll give you your orders when I'm ready. Again, there was a curious lethargy. One explanation is that Napoleon felt the Prussians were finished anyway, and now it was just a matter of moving his army over here to destroy the British, because, of course, Ney would surely pin down the British, wouldn't he? <laughs> or would he? When the Duke of Wellington heard what happened to Blucher, he ordered an immediate retreat at dawn on the 17th. Uh, as he said, I suppose, he said, I suppose they'll say back in England that we've been trounced, but we have no choice. If Blucher is going back, I have to go back too, and ordered his army to withdraw in the direction of Brussels but not to just withdraw blindly. He had already picked out a good defensive position, which he intended to hold, and he sent word to Blucher uh, that he was trying, going to hold it and would really hope that Blucher would come to his assistance. When I say sent word, that means sending a guy on a horse to ride 10 miles cross country, partly in the dark. Whether the message ever gets there or not is questionable, but as it happens, Blucher and Wellington did manage to stay in touch somehow throughout all of this. Nay, did nothing, he sat there. And around 11 or 12, when Napoleon finally came over and inquired what was happening and discovered Ney's troops sitting there in the grass eating a late breakfast, he said, well, where's Wellington? And they said, oh, he retreated some time ago. And Napoleon was profoundly moved. Does he have to tell a marshal of France to pursue an enemy who was retreating and keep him off balance? Napoleon was so upset, he took his escort squadrons and charged after the British himself. However, at that moment, the sky opened and a downpour began a terrible downpour that continued for the whole day and long into the night. This turned all everything into a quagmire and meant there'd be no pursuit of any kind. All armies would slog through the mud, getting wetter and wetter and wetter until the evening when Wellington reached his stop position, which was here. I'll be referring to this map quite a bit. Red is British and blue is French. There's a ridge here, a very low ridge, which was the main defensive position. Hougamont, a fortified chateau. We'll see in a minute. La Haye Saint, a fortified chateau. Papalot and the gravel pit, although they don't show the gravel pit, a fortified area. Advanced posts to break up enemy attacks. The British army was disposed, uh, the Anglo Allied army was disposed in this fashion between front cavalry, it's this cavalry, uh, to the rear. Chassé's Dutch Belgian division over here, in case Napoleon tried to go around uh, the British uh, right flank. Uh, Wellington intended to fight a purely defensive battle uh, and hold out until he hoped the Prussians arrived. Uh, Napoleon's plan was brutally simple. The first corps, these four divisions, the ones who had gotten lost two days ago, were put right here. They wouldn't get lost, they have to go straight forward. They, they won't miss the enemy today. He would first set up a battery of 80 cannon. The Grand Battery is one of his favorite tricks to annihilate Wellington's left. He would then attack the Chateau of Hougoumont to make Wellington think that was the main attack and hopefully Wellington would send troops down to Hougoumont to help. He would then send the First Corps right through the center of the British line to crush it by brute force, after which it would be scattered to the four winds and uh, pinned against the forest that was behind here. Uh, but he didn't get the battle started early. Normally you start right at the break of day. Why wait? 
He didn't start because his commanders told him, and he knew himself that the ground was very soft from all this rain. It had finally stopped raining. But it was hard to move the artillery into position, and if the artillery fired at soft ground, the cannonball doesn't hit and bounce and hit and bounce. It just goes spook. Since the French had twice as much artillery as the British, they wanted to use it, and Napoleon consented to delaying the start of the attack until around noon, when the ground would have dried out some. Napoleon had no notion that the Prussians might show up. The Prussian army had been scattered, and besides, Grouchy was pursuing them. But was he? <clears throat> Immediately after Grouchy got started, it was reported large numbers of troop, Prussian troops were moving east. He went after them first. Those were Rhineland soldiers who had all deserted. About 15,000 of them. They were just leaving. They were going away. Uh, Blucher's main army was moving towards Wavre, and by the time that Grouchy, who was shown here going off in this direction, got turned around and went in this direction, he was several hours marched behind Blucher. He did not have his sword in Blucher's back. He was nowhere near Blucher. Blucher himself, when he finally came to, more or less, when they brought him in and rubbed him down with brandy and, and sort of got him up to the point of coherence again, uh, was told by his chief of staff, look, the British didn't come and help us. Why should we go and help them? Let's just go home. And Blucher said, you want me to desert my friend Wellington? I will not do that. We will move all the troops we can to help him as soon as we can. And that decision was absolutely crucial for the outcome of the battle. Of course, moving the troops meant reorganizing them first, but he had a whole corps of fresh troops coming in as well, the fourth corps in the course of the day. So Blucher made that decision, and Wellington can be very grateful that he did, but this would take hours. Okay, the battle began. It's hard to say exact times. Lots of people had watches, but apparently they were a little busy to look at them, or at least to write down when something happened. So you get contradictory time reports, and you can't be very precise. But somewhere around 11 or 12, the French commenced their attack on Hougoumont. Now, you may have never heard of Hougoumont, but just as all Americans have heard of the Alamo, everybody in Britain has certainly heard of Hougoumont. To call it a farm or a farmhouse is a little deceptive. It's a little fortress. This is what Belgian farmhouses were built like. You have the farmhouse, the stables, the chapel, the wall around the whole thing, the gates. This is a natural fortress. Wellington had put into this troops of the British guards, the best troops he had, with orders to hold it. Just hold it. Just, just don't give it up. And what happened at Hougoumont was that the French began attacking in the morning and attacked in the afternoon and attacked in the evening. Jerome's division was dragged in. Foix's division was dragged in, part of Bachelot's division was dragged in, but not in a coordinated attack. They made heroic efforts to break in, such as this one, when they did break down the main gate, but the British managed to close that gate and nail it shut, and they held out there for the whole of the day into the nighttime. By nighttime, the whole place was burning because the French probably finally brought up mortars and used mortar shells to set it on fire, but it never surrendered. Wellington kept careful tabs on it and sent in small numbers of reinforcements. Napoleon, who was busy elsewhere, paid little attention to what was going on at Boudemont, and far too many troops were absorbed in this effort to do what was, after all, a secondary task uh, to make the British think that this was a major French effort. Well, it became a major French effort, but it didn't help the French very much. Hougoumont is very, very famous indeed. Okay, let's go back to this map. Derwal's attack went in around 1 o'clock or 1.30. Four divisions marching across this little valley. One division masked this area. The others went straight up here. They were exposed to British artillery fire. The Grand Battery of the French did little damage because Wellington did not put his men on top of the ridge. He put them on the reverse slope. That is to say, on the back part of the ridge. They can't see anything. People on top of the ridge can see things, the scouts, but they are not exposed to nearly as much artillery fire because artillery fire is not indirect fire. The French advanced in murderous formations, very close packed formations. Uh, the Corps commander made that decision. It was a bad one, suffering heavy casualties. When they reached this point, they came under flanking fire from La Haye Saint and Papillot, but on they went, there were a lot of them, up to the top of the ridge met the Dutch and British troops. Some of the Dutch troops fell back, shot to pieces. Some of the British troops were wavering. General Picton, the British commander, was shot from the head and killed. It was not clear if, despite their casualties, the French would manage to finally break this part of the line. But at this point, Wellington unleashed his heavy cavalry, and they charged down on the French. The French did not have cavalry with them to counter this. The French had not brought much artillery with them. And the result was that their lost corps was largely routed fleeing across the valley, pursued by the victorious British cavalry, 
as is seen in this painting, which you've probably seen before. And you can read in the, uh, in the caption there, uh, you know what, uh, what actually happened. The trouble with charging cavalry in warfare is that it doesn't like to stop if it's won. It's very hard to stop charging cavalry. And the British heavy cavalry, of which this was only one of about seven regiments, the Scots Grazier, sabered the French royally, rode across the valley, and rode right up into the French artillery battery, <laughs> which blasted them, and then Napoleon unleashed his own cavalry, and the British heavy cavalry was largely chopped to pieces. So the first stage of the battle here was that Napoleon lost the use of the first corps, except as skirmishers, uh, but the British lost most of their heavy cavalry, uh, the remnants withdrawing behind the lines, although some of them could, uh, some of them could still, uh, still fight. It was about this time that somebody noticed way off to the east, a little cloud on the horizon, so to speak, a little darkening on this area here. And Napoleon said, it is Grouchy. Grouchy has come to help. Why did he think that? Because Grouchy was a marshal of France, and surely knew that if he was far behind the Prussians and couldn't catch them anyway, and he could hear the sound of the tremendous cannonade from Waterloo about 10 miles away, then Grouchy being about up here, instead of continuing to go like that, would go like that. He would bring his troops to the sound of the guns. And that's what Napoleon assumed. But in fact, Grouchy wasn't doing that. One of Grouchy's corps commanders had said, Sir, we should march to the sound of the guns. At least send one of your two corps. And Grouchy said, The last orders I have from the emperor are to pursue the Prussians and pursue them I shall. I shall march to Havre. He might as well march to the moon for all the good he was going to do for the, next, the rest of this battle. No, when French cavalry returned with a few prisoners, they were wearing black uniforms, and they were, in fact, Prussian troops. The result was that Napoleon suddenly had to confront the fact that some Prussians were going to show up. He could have called off the battle. He did not do so. He moved the Sixth Corps, two divisions, to this area to form a flank guard, and said, we can beat the British before the Prussians show up in significant numbers. The Prussians were showing up drop by drop. They had had a hard, long march. Somebody had set part of Wavre on fire. They were marching through the mud. This was not a coordinated attack, but more and more would arrive, building up to 40 or 50,000 by the end of the day. While Napoleon was taking care of this problem, Marshal Ney noticed something happening in the British line. Some of it was pulling back maybe 50 or 70 yards. Wellington had ordered some of his troops back to a safer position. They also saw a considerable number of people in red uniforms leaving the battlefield. These were actually wounded, and some people who didn't want to fight anymore. One of the easiest ways to get out of a traditional battle, by the way, without being branded for cowardice, is to find somebody who's wounded and say, let me help you. And so you have one guy with an arm wound and four other people helping him off the battlefield and they go off to the field hospital where they're perfectly good. May said, Wellington is retreating. Send in the heavy cavalry. And he ordered a large number of French cuirassiers, the armored cavalry, uh, breastplates, to charge across this field at the British, who were in fact not retreating. The result was the greatest succession of cavalry charges probably in the history of warfare. Maybe Genghis Khan did better, but I'm not so, I'm not so familiar with that. Uh, we have these enormous French cavalry charges, and here is an artist in Prussia, the Marshal Ney, a redhead here, at the head of these troops. One British officer wrote, not a man present who survived could have forgotten in the afterlife the awful grandeur of that charge. You saw in the distance what appeared to be an overwhelming long-moving line, whichever advancing glittered like a stormy wave of the sea when it catches the sunlight. On came the mounted hosts until they got near enough, while the very earth seemed to vibrate beneath their thundering tramp. One might have supposed that nothing could have resisted the shock of this terrible moving mass. They were the famous cuirassiers, almost all old soldiers who had distinguished themselves on most of the battlefields of Europe. In an almost incredibly short period, they were within 20 yards of us, shouting, Vive l'Empereur! The word of command prepared to receive cavalry having been given. Every man in the front rank knelt, and a wall bristling with steel held together by steady hands presented itself to the infuriated cuirassiers. What the infantry would do in a situation like this is form square. Uh, you form a dense mass facing in all directions with the colors and leaders right in the very middle here. And front right kneeling, horses will not charge solid objects. The cavalry is only armed with swords. If a square is steady, it can stop any cavalry attack. If a square is unsteady, if they flinch, if the cavalry breaks in, of course, they chop the whole thing to pieces. Squares are normally impervious to cavalry, and therefore what you do is use the cavalry to force the infantry to form square and bring up artillery, which can then blow the squares to pieces, but nay, forgot the artillery, and just used cavalry. The charge fell back. He made another one. Napoleon returned to the battlefield and said, what is he doing? He was losing the battle. But having committed the cavalry, 
we have to go through with it. So he committed even more until something like 15,000 French cavalry were launching these charges. And after an hour and a half or so, the French heavy cavalry was largely shot to pieces and useless. Wellington's line had held, but when these units moved back into line, you could see where the squares were from the dead men who were lying there. One British officer later wrote, he said, I wondered if there had ever been a battle in which nobody survived at all, because it seemed that this was going to be one. While this was going on, the Prussians had built up superior numbers and were now coming in on the flank here against the French, and they were moving forward so far forward that they took the city, a uh, little town of pont saint -Noir. Now this sits directly on the French line of communications. This cannot be uh, permitted. This shows the French cavalry charges going in over here, completely unsupported by infantry or any meaningful amounts of artillery. pont saint -Noir was seized, the Prussians stormed into the place, like that, and this was very serious. Napoleon said, do not worry. He sent two battalions of the old guard, his best soldiers, to retake pont saint -Noir. Uh, which was held by 14 battalions of Prussian troops. The Imperial Guard went forward. They were ordered not to shoot, just go in with bayonets. And when many of the Prussians just saw the bearskin caps of these famous troops, they decided they had dental appointments or something. They'd go elsewhere. The two battalions of the Old Guard retook pont chased the Prussians completely out, restored the flank, which would now hold for a while longer, but in time, there's going to be too many Prussians there, and Napoleon knew that by now. And so now the question is, can he do anything else? In the center of the British line was this place, La Haye Saint, another of these fortified farm complexes. Napoleon finally told Ney, would you take La Haye Saint? Because if you take La Haye Saint, we will have a position from which we can threaten the center of the British line, right there. Someone should have thought of that earlier. Ney suddenly becomes the good old Ney. He takes a unit of infantry, some cavalry, some artillery, moves up, nice combined arm attack, arm attack. The King's German Legion that were holding La Haye Saint at this moment started to run out of ammunition, which was convenient, and the French took the place. They moved an artillery battery up to here, firing directly in the center of Wellington's line. Wellington was getting a little desperate at this point because Napoleon still had an ultimate reserve that he could commit, but it was clear that the crisis of the battle had in fact arrived. Uh, if something wasn't done soon, the Prussians would completely crush his flank, and therefore the last act of the battle was the attack of the Imperial Guard. Napoleon could not use the whole thing. By now the Young Guard had been committed at Poissonois. He had two battalions as his ultimate reserve, but he sent five battalions of the Guard, about 4,000 men, ordered to attack this weakened spot in Wellington's line. Situation at 7.30 here with the guard going across. The Prussian is now building up on the flank. Placenau is still held by the French. And this magnificent painting by the British artist Ernest Crofts depicts this. Napoleon actually led the guard himself towards the enemy. Uh, one thinks that rather like General Lee at Spotsylvania, he had become so excited that he was going to personally lead the attack. He was persuaded not to do this. Uh, but here we see him saluting uh, the troops of the guard as they march past for their final attack, the artillery battery, the, the grand battery in the background is still firing. The artist paid a lot of attention to detail. Look at this guy. This guy is a civilian wearing wooden shoes. Who's this guy? This was a Belgian peasant. Uh, the French wanted a local guide, so they picked this Belgian farmer and said, you're going to help us today. They thought he might not want to, so they thoughtfully tied his hands together and put the end of the rope in the hands of this French cavalryman so the fellow wouldn't leave, but he acted as Napoleon's guide uh, for the uh, Battlefield. Forgotten people of history. There'll probably be a dissertation written about them soon because we're much more conscious of these types of folks now. Napoleon salutes the guard as they go in. He turned command of the attack over to <coughs> Marshal Ney. The attack was entirely uncoordinated. The five battalions did not go in as a unit and they veered off course. Instead of going for the weakened part of the, French, uh, the British line, they veered off to the left where Wellington, seeing this attack coming, had moved Chassé's Dutch division over here, had moved the rest of the British guards over here and told some of them to lie down, and was getting ready to receive the guard. The guard came up the slope, scattered some units, and then ran into solid opposition. At one point, uh, Wellington uh, shouted, now Maitland, now's your time, and British troops concealed about 40 yards in the grass, stood up and fired point blank into the enemy column. There was a ferocious firefight, and at the end of it, British units flanked the guard, which had not enough troops supporting it, and they began to fall back down the slope. They didn't run, but they retreated. And this was unbelievable. This had never happened before. Practically the whole French army that could see anything was watching this attack, which had to be decisive. The guard always was victorious, and they weren't. And the shout went up, sauve qui peut, save yourself if you can. And within half an hour or so, the entire French army 
dissolved, except for the two battalions of the old guard here, the senior units and a few other units. They just ran. Napoleon didn't have to worry about conducting a retreat. The troops were doing it all by themselves. They just ran off the battlefield. The whole army collapsed. Uh, and that was reaching towards the end of the battle. Uh, Wellington and Blucher met at uh, La Haye Saint. Napoleon himself left in his carriage but eventually reached the point where the carriage couldn't easily get along these roads in this massive route. He himself was protected only by these men of the old guard, otherwise these panic-stricken people would overrun him, got on his horse and run away. The British ran away, uh, rode away. Uh, the British captured the carriage and everything in it uh, and put it on display. One of the things they captured in the carriage uh, was a sword that Napoleon was intending to wear uh, in his entry into Brussels, and it looked just like this. This was presented to me by my students in 1984, 31 years ago. It's a nice thing that ever happened to me as a teacher. A uh, replica of Napoleon's sword uh, uh, captured in the Waterloo campaign. Napoleon rode back to Paris, still hoping perhaps for some support, but the fact is that uh, public opinion tended to turn against him after this defeat. The French political leaders thought he couldn't win. And three days later, he abdicated the throne for the second time. <coughs> Wellington and Blucher met at La Belle Alliance, a very appropriately named place. Uh, Wellington couldn't speak German, and Blucher couldn't speak English, and Blucher couldn't speak much French either, so they just sort of smiled a lot and shook hands. Uh, Blucher said, quelle affaire, what an affair. Uh, and then it is reported, since he was still, he had been rubbed down with brandy the previous day, he may have said, ich stinke etwas. I do smell a little, uh, but they were victorious allies. They agreed that the Prussians would send some troops to pursue because Wellington's army was in no condition to pursue anything. Neither were the Prussians, really. Off in the 10 miles away, Marshal Grouchy had attacked the Prussians who had been left in Wavre and managed to beat them. And then he received news of what had happened at Waterloo. And suddenly he becomes a military genius. In the next few days, he took his whole force back to France safely without being intercepted by anyone who was trying to catch him. The problem seems to be that Napoleon was such a genius that he hadn't trained his subordinates to think for themselves when he was thought to be doing all the thinking. And as a result, people like Grouchy and Ney were always waiting to be told what to do and didn't seem to operate independently, whereas they were perfectly capable of it if they, if they had to. Blucher and Wellington became national heroes, of course. Louis XVIII, now known as Louis the Inevitable, was brought back to France as king, whether anybody liked him or not. And as for Napoleon, we do know what happened to Napoleon. Uh, he threw himself on the mercy of the British, since otherwise he could have been killed as an outlaw, and was eventually sent to the island of St. Helena. Perhaps the last word in this presentation should be with the great winner, the Duke of Wellington, who later wrote, My heart is broken by the terrible loss I have sustained in my old friends and companions and my poor soldiers. Believe me, nothing but a battle lost can be half so melancholy as a battle won. If you want casualty figures, we don't have terribly accurate ones. It is thought that the Allies, the Prussians and British, lost 52,000 men, <coughs> the French perhaps 57,000 men. Uh, the French, of course, had half as many men as the Allies. It was one of the bloodiest, most savagely fought battles, really, in history. But it was decisive. Those who say battles never settle anything, well, this settled Europe for the next 30 years, anyway. Uh, whether the settlement was greatly to be desired, the restoration of absolute monarchies, the attempt to abolish the French Revolution, the imposition of censorship, and, and suspicion of the middle and lower classes by the upper classes is arguable, but it certainly uh, settled things, and of course made everyone connected with it uh, very, 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 very famous. Well, are there any questions? Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. And now you know all about Waterloo, so when you see it in the papers, you can, you can fill in the blanks. <laughs> Class is <laughs> <laughs>